intensive learning and very practical things that you can put into practice in your life immediately. Um, I've built a four-part series from Michelle Woodruff's book, Exposure, Developing and Reflecting God's Image. And over the four weeks, we're breaking down 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 5 through 7. Again, that's 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 5 through 7. Before we read that, review with me the five important concepts of growth in discipleship for cultivating salvation. That's a phrase that we've used over the last few weeks, cultivating salvation. What are those five points? Well, these are, these are five ways to live. Number one, self-distrust. Self-distrust. Don't automatically trust yourself. Don't trust your instincts. In fact, you should start to practice the proverb that says, do not lean on your own understanding, but in all your ways acknowledge it, and he will direct your path. I have found that it's healthy to just admit that I know the scoundrel that I could be. I don't have the, a blemish-free, perfect track record. And it, here's what I need to know is that there are always booby traps around me. And so rather than going through life and just saying, oh, I've got this, I'm all that in a bag of chips. <laughs> Instead of being that way, I should have red flags and just say, no, wait a minute, do I trust this? Number two, be cautious. Take caution, be aware of the enemy's devices. That means don't go through life unguarded. Don't let yourself be set up for failure. Number three, have a tender conscience. It's huge. It is very important to have a, a tender conscience. Number four, watch out for temptation. Don't assume that you're above temptation. Don't assume that, you know, that nothing could tempt you. But always be watching out and, and have your antenna up. And then number five, shrink back from dishonoring. Anything that would dishonor Jesus. I remember Paint Stewart, um, the great golfer, just uh, literally months before he died in a car crash. I can't remember the name of the tournament he was in and exactly which year, but I remember he's on the 18th green and He's getting ready to putt, and they zoomed in on his hands, and there was a wristband. You've seen these. They're very popular. WWJD. What would Jesus do? And apparently, if Jesus were a golfer, he would sink the putt, because that's exactly what Payne Stewart, I mean, <laughs> he won that tournament, and he gave a glowing Christian testimony. I just thought, this is amazing. Just stood up and just put it right on the top shelf for Jesus. And I think that's good for us that we should always be asking ourselves, is this something that honors Jesus? Would Jesus participate in this? Is this an activity Jesus would do? In other words, anything that I participate in, I ought to be able to say, Jesus, just sit right there beside me and let's just enjoy this together. And if I feel uncomfortable doing that, then I need to say, oh, I'm going to shrink back from that. Um, there are eight components of maturity in 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 5 through 7. Last week we talked about the first two, faith and virtue. And remember this, uh, this image that, that we started to diagram last week. Faith and virtue, you're going to see that there's this process. It progresses all the way through really what becomes a cycle for our lives that we discipline ourselves to walk in, in this manner. So, 2 Peter 1, 5 through 7. So make every effort to apply the benefits of these promises to your life. Then your faith will produce a life of moral excellence. Faith will produce virtue. A life of moral excellence leads to knowing God better, 
Knowing God leads to self-control. Self-control leads to patient endurance. And patient endurance leads to godliness. Godliness leads to love for other Christians. And finally, you, you, have, you, you will grow to have genuine love for everyone. So that is New Living Translation from 1996. Here it is worded another way. Verse number five. Listen to this. For this very reason, adding diligence to the divine promises, employ every effort in exercising your faith, your faith, to develop virtue. Faith develops virtue. And in exercising virtue, develop knowledge. There's three things I want to talk to you about tonight. Knowledge. Self-control. And what I want you to see is this progression that's happening. It's, it's really a, a wheel that moves back around. And then the third one is going to be patience. Faith, virtue, knowledge, self-control, patience. So last week we talked about uh, faith. We talked about virtue. Tonight I want to talk to you about those three things. Knowledge, self-control, and patience. So I spend a few minutes talking about knowledge. Uh, there's two different concepts in the Bible. Knowledge and wisdom. Uh, those concepts carry through in the Old Testament and in the New Testament. But especially in the Old Testament and, and especially in the book of Proverbs, you see that wisdom shows up quite a bit. So there's, there's a slight little variation between what knowledge is and, and what wisdom is. And we're going to talk about that here in a few minutes. But first, just to show you an example of this, what the book of Proverbs does, Proverbs, the book of wisdom, compares wisdom against foolishness. It's, it's a, a contrast. Wisdom contrasted against foolishness. And you read it over and over in the book of the Proverbs. For instance, the wise inherit honor, but fools get only shame. A wise son brings joy to his father, but a foolish son brings grief. The wise in heart accept commands, but a chattering fool comes to ruin. You see, they're just back and forth. The wise, the foolish. Um, the wise store up knowledge, but the mouth of a fool invites ruin. Whoever brings ruin on their family will inherit only win, and the fool will be servant to the wise. Here's another proverb. The way of fools seems right to them, but the wise listen to advice. Here's another one. Walk with the wise and become wise, for a companion of fools suffers harm. Just one more. The wise woman builds her house, but with her own hands, the foolish one tears hers down. So you, you see that Proverbs, and I, that's just a little sampling. You could easily fill up a page full, maybe 60 different references from the Proverbs comparing a wise person to a fool. And interestingly, wise doesn't necessarily just mean age. There can, I, I have known some older fools. I've known some young wise people. But that is one, that's one carry-on package of wisdom is that wisdom does increase with age. To me, there's few things better than a seasoned Christian who has been serving the Lord for many years. And they've just they've just been through a lot and they've experienced a lot of things. And then when they talk to you, they're able to get that perspective and bring that wisdom to the table. That's a very special gift to the body of Christ. But here, however, in, in 2 Peter chapter 1, it's not speaking of, of wisdom, but knowledge. And, and let's study this word knowledge for just a moment. Knowledge is the Greek word gnosis. In English, we would spell it G-N-O-S-I-S, -S, gnosis. Um, you can hear, know, 
K-N-O-W, gnosis. That our word know, our word knowledge comes from gnosis. And you can hear it embedded in that Greek word. If you put ah in front of a Greek word, that's the way of negating something. Like, for instance, canceling it out. In English, we would say un, U-N. Undo, undress, un-American. In Greek, the way you do that is put ah in front of the word. Atheos. Atheist. Theos is God. Atheos is a person that denies the existence of God. Atheist. That's exactly what that word is. There, this word, gnosis, has a similar thing. Agnosis. Agnostic is our word, agnosis. It means um, defined as uh, nothing can be known or understood about God. So there's some people that say, I'm, I'm agnostic. That means we can't figure anything out about God. I, I don't believe God because he's, he's so distant, he's so far removed. He doesn't care about us in any respect. And so atheism and agnosticism go hand in hand. They're so, so very often uh, partners together. But what's the difference then between wisdom and knowledge? Well, wisdom seems to be absorbed through godly living over time. Knowledge seems to be <coughs> applied learning through intentional effort. Wisdom is gleaned. It's received. But knowledge is revealed. And both of those things partner together in our lives. Now, Peter, when he's describing the development of character, and he, he gives us this model, this wheel, and, and, and we're looking at all of this throughout the, throughout the four weeks. It's verses 5 through 7, chapter 1. He, he really gives us this picture of how important knowledge is in our lives. That it's important. It's, it's important that we're not just existing and, and absorbing, but we are applying intentional learning. That's part of the development of character. So there's a, a beautiful picture from the book of Hosea chapter 2. Listen to Hosea 2 verses 19 and 20. And, and it really speaks about the intimacy of the level that God wants for us to have with Him in our knowledge, in our relationship with Him. Listen to me read it, Hosea 2, 19 and 20. It, this, is, this is the Lord speaking. I will betroth you to me forever. I will betroth you in righteousness and justice, in love and compassion. I will betroth you in faithfulness and you will acknowledge the Lord. Now he's talking obviously about a, a covenant marriage, a betrothal, a, a true love that I am your God and you are my people and I'm choosing you and I betroth myself to you. But the phrase acknowledge the Lord, really when you look at the de definition of the end of verse 20, um, it gives you a picture of the development of our relationship to God. Because here's how it's defined. Acknowledge the Lord is defined as to know, to recognize, to be acquainted with, to appreciate, to give heed to, and to cherish. Now, what Michelle Woodruff does with that phrase is takes, takes it and expands the definition into five levels of relationship where, where God says, I will betroth you and you will acknowledge the Lord. Five different levels that we have in our relationship with the Lord. And the first one is recognition. Second, acquaintance. Third, appreciation. Fourth, heedful. And fifth is cherished. Let me talk about each one of those. 
First one, recognition. Have you ever heard someone say a name and you go, oh yeah, I recognize the name. I know who, I know that person by name. I did that just this last week. Uh, someone said to me, do you know so-and-so? And I said, you know what? I know, I know the name. I mean, we've, we've all done that. And, and there's some people that their level of relationship with the Lord, that's all it ever really gets to, sadly. Do you know the Lord? Sure, I do. I'm American. <laughs> Have you heard of Jesus? Why, yes, I'm a Christian. But, but they don't really, truly, sadly, get beyond that to ever really have a, the next level of a relationship, which is acquaintance. Now, more than just recognizing, acquaintance is you know who they are, and they know who you are. Do you know, do you know um, so-and-so? Oh, well, we're acquainted. I know, I know who he is. He, yeah, he doesn't really know me. He probably, he, might, he probably would remember my name. Um, that, that's acquaintance level. And some people, they rec it's more than recognizing God. They're acquainted with God. But they never really go any further than that, sadly. But the third level is appreciation. And appreciation is just simply defined as admiration. It is to truly admire the person. So this would be more than just, yeah, I must be a Christian because I live in America and we're part of the West, Western world. You know, this is our culture. More than that, it is, I really appreciate the Lord. I, I honor what He has done. I recognize it and I admire Him so much. And, and then the fourth level even moves deeper than that, to be heedful is it's defined this way to really pay attention to something so in my relationship with god it's no longer just that i know him on the surface level and, and it's more than admiring who he is but it's going deeper than that and, and it's saying i'm really going to pay careful attention to that relationship of course the goal is the fifth level cherished it means to hold dear, to hold dear. That if something hurt my Lord, then it hurts me. That's how close I am to Him. That if, if I feel pain, He knows it. And even before I begin to pray, that closeness, I think that's truly what He, he desires in each of our lives. And so knowledge is, you, you could think of knowledge this way. It is comprehensive insight it's revealed learning and as you're moving through what Peter says he says faith is the beginning place which leads to virtue or depending on the translation right living righteousness uh, a life of moral excellence which then gives way to knowledge now we want to go on further because the next thing is self-control. For this very reason, adding diligence to the divine promises, employ every effort in exercising your faith to develop virtue, and in exercising virtue, develop knowledge, and in exercising knowledge, develop self-control. Self-control, it means to master your desires and your passion, to master them. So that your desires and your passions don't tell you what to do. You tell your desires and your passions what to do. That's self-control. Why is it easier on some things than on other things? I mean, you don't have to live any amount of time at all until you know this. And as you're walking with the Lord as a Christian, it just seems like we're all a little different. You know, we all have our own way. But for some of us... Uh, it just, you know, one thing is just so easy. Like, oh, I can master that. No worries, I got this. But something else that maybe somebody else they wouldn't struggle with at all, for some unknown reason, that'll be the thing you struggle with. And it's like, it's it's just a little thing, but it oh, it makes me mad. It masters me instead of me being the master over it. It's like it tells me what to do. 
little master, big slave. It should not be that way. It's not supposed to be that way in our lives. And, and um, I was watching a, a video for a men's conference coming up, and I loved what the speaker said on the video. He says, um, he says, you know, when we when we come to Christ, um, just because you come to Christ doesn't mean the old man is gone. You got to work on that old man. He says, now, you know what? For some of us in the body of Christ, they just they come to Jesus. They say, Lord, I, I want you to be my Savior. And it's, like, it's just like, poof. they're just they're clean, you know. They no worries, and, and they don't have any struggles. And and there's a few amens. And then he said, we hate those people, don't we? <laughs> he said, for the rest of us, it's real work. It's a lot of hard work, and, and we have to discipline ourselves and thank God for His work in our life that He wants to sanctify us and take us to next levels, but He wants to partner with us. He wants us to surrender over to Him completely and totally. And so this uh, self-control can be evident in our lives. So why is it that some things are easier and some things are harder? It's simple. Your level of discipline is based upon your level of surrender. This is an important concept. If there's something in my life that's beating me up and mastering me, it shows me that that area of my life has not been surrendered totally to Jesus. And once I surrender and relinquish the reins and say, God, you just take it, it is entirely yours, that's when He can begin to work in our lives and bring about the control that, that we desperately need. It's an, important, it's an important point. So we just said that knowledge is comprehensive insight and that as you exercise that insight that it's going to lead to self-control. Um, in other words, here, here's the thing. Self-control is not automatic. You have, to, you have to work at it. So, in, in your life, you can have knowledge of a matter and yet still choose not to exercise self-control. And that's a real defining moment for the Christian to have moved through these areas and come to this part where you know something, you, you know it on a level, but you, you don't allow that insight and that wisdom and that knowledge to result in self-control in your life. Self-control is exercising the knowledge that you have received. That's, that's what self-control is. And so I, I see this progression that Peter is using for our lives, and it really is true. Uh, Galatians talks about self-control. Remember this? The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, gentleness, goodness, faith, uh, meekness, temperance, self-control. And it says against such things, there is no law. You will never get arrested for loving someone too much. There's no law against too much patience. In other words, if you really put this into practice in your life, how much good is going to come out of it? But there are laws against the other list that he gives at the end of the chapter, the hatred, the discord, the jealousy, the anger, the wrath. we got laws for things like that. We have to by the very nature of things. But I, I just give you carte blanche to just go out there and be as gentle as you want to be. You can just be gentle all day long. There's no law against it. You, you can just be patient and kind and, and loving and exercise faith, and you can do that all you want, and it's not against the law. It's not against the Old Testament law. It's not against the, the teachings that Moses instructed the people of Israel when he said these are the Ten Commandments. And by the way, any nation that will honor the Ten Commandments will be blessed by God. If, if you haven't known this already, any, any nation that will bless Israel and pray for the peace of Jerusalem will be blessed by God. Any nation that curses her will be cursed. The rise and fall of nations, the orchestration, the rise and fall of leaders has hinged upon that historically. Um, we were just talking about 
wisdom and foolishness. Uh, one of the Proverbs says, the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. But if, if we would just acknowledge God and, and invite him into our practice as a people, we would be so, so blessed. But the fruit of the Spirit. So it, one of the listings of the, the fruit of the Spirit, and, and my take on the fruit of the Spirit, is not that it's, it's not an exhaustive list. It's not like Paul sat down and said, these are the nine fruit, and these are the only ones. He's giving us this picture of this is kind of what it's like. And they all uh, just, they work in con concord together. And, and um, for instance, you couldn't have any of these without love. Um, but by the same token, you couldn't have any of them without self-control. So the fruit of the Spirit working in our lives. But self-control is, is so important. Now, fruit, just for a moment, before we get back to this main text here, talking about Galatians chapter 5, the fruit of the Spirit. Fruit, think of it this way. It's defined as the work of by which His presence within us accomplishes things. Yes. I like to think of it this way, the fruit of the Spirit, or you could say it this way, the byproduct of the Spirit, or the result of the Spirit. When the Spirit of God is in our lives, then these things just begin to grow like fruit. It's a beautiful picture. It, it manifests in our lives. Peace and goodness and kindness and faithfulness and gentleness. Self-control. So, I can't exercise self-control over areas I haven't received knowledge in. Now, now think about this. Um, if, if I don't know something, if it hasn't been revealed to me, if I've never been taught it, then I'm not able to exercise self-control in that area. That's because I have no frame of reference. But if I do receive knowledge, then I become responsible to respond to that knowledge and to exercise self-control. And sometimes when we don't exercise self-control, it's not because we don't know something, we have knowledge, but we just lose our focus. See, what I find a lot of times in the body of Christ is that people just get tired and worn out and exhausted. And, you know, we're living the American dream, but we're not really living the biblical model of six days of work and then a day of rest. We're not, you know, we're living the American dream, but we're not always living the model of honor the Sabbath to keep that day holy unto the Lord. In other words, setting aside a day each week, we worship not on the Sabbath, but on the Lord's day. But, but it's, it's the concept of just, it's devoted to you. This is your day, Lord. And this is also a day to worship. It's also a day to just rest my body and to relax. A lot of times, Christians get so exhausted, so weary, and so tired that we start to lose the focus, and that's when we can get blindsided. So we've got to always keep that focus and keep self-control. Um, the last thing we're going to talk about tonight is patience, because this verse says, and in exercising knowledge, develop self-control. And in exercising self-control, develop patience. In exercising self-control, develop patience. I'm sure you've all heard the joke about the man that prayed for patience. God, give me patience. Right now! <laughs> we can relate to that. We just be careful if you ask for patience because God's method of bringing about patience is self control. So if, if you say, God, I need patience in my life, God's going to say, Oh, great, let me give you some opportunities to exercise self control. That way he knows when patience is developing in our lives. Um, Nick has 
really put on a, a lot of muscle over this last year. Um, he's, you know, he's in athletics and, and he's lifting weights for a, a good stretch of the last year. He did the, the protein drinks and shakes and he, was, he would lift weights at school and then not only do that but lift again when he got home. I mean, I, I'm really amazed. I told Steph this morning, just look at this picture. I saw a picture of him almost identically a year ago to the day. It was the end of July last year. Look, just look at him and look at him now. I mean, he has put on a lot of muscle. The kid is, I don't tell him this, but I mean, you can kind of throw it down around on the basketball court. But I'm not going to let him know. I hope he's not out there listening. But he was telling me last night about this new lifting plan that he's on. Um, it's, it's called Monster Reps. And so he's describing how it works. Dad, here's how monster reps work. So usually you do bench press, and then you stop, and you recover. And then, you know, you do curls, and you stop, and you recover. But monster reps has studied the science of how blood flow works and how when your body is really exhausted, when you push, then you actually you get more protein by blood going through because you're pushing yourself. And so he said, so I, what I do is I, you know, I do my bench press and then I immediately go to the curls and by the end of that last curl, it's like, oh, I got nothing left. He said, those are monster reps. Isn't it cool, Dad? I'm like, you know, that just doesn't sound cool to me. <laughs> I mean, I'll be honest, just at all. Um, but I am thrilled for him. Now, when you work out, you tear down muscle. Literally, when, uh, when you're lifting weights, it, it, is, it is tearing down muscle. Tiny little torn ligaments inside your muscle. That's the soreness you feel. So two days later, three days later, you're walking around like a zombie because you're so sore you worked out. It's because you, you tore, literally tore down the muscle. There's actually now a medical treatment prescribed. I know people who do this for their back. Um, Kobe Bryant does this in the NBA. Goes to get treatments where a needle is stuck down in the muscle tissue and they tear the muscle to stimulate uh, recovery and growth and, and healing and it's like a, a new uh, treatment that's that's available now when you are developing your spirit man the flesh and when I say that I don't mean you know the flesh like the skin and the body but I mean the carnal nature when you're developing the spirit man that carnal nature gets sore, feels pain, experiences discomfort, just the same way. And it will play on your mind. It will tell you, I can't do this. I can't take this. I can't live this life. When you're experiencing soreness, that is a good thing. You're developing muscle to be patient and to be a person of self-control. Strong's Concordance defines patience this way. It says, it is the characteristic of a man who is not swerved from his deliberate purpose and his loyalty to faith and holiness by even the greatest trials and sufferings. I'm going to read that again. Strong's definition of, of what uh, patience is. Quote, the characteristic of a man who is not swerved from his deliberate purpose and his loyalty to faith and holiness by even the greatest trials and sufferings. That's patience. Long suffering in some versions. Oxford American writers, the Sora says it this way, patience, quote, to be forgiving, tolerant, accommodating and selfless patience so as, as we wrap up tonight just I want you to have this picture of the cycle that we're moving through we've only covered the first five there's three more that will fill in the blank Peter's going to do that for us next Wednesday night 
And like I say, you'll find that it's actually a cycle that we go through. God has us in this cycle that repeats so that he can bring about character development in our lives. Think about how this works. It, faith is the beginning place. You believe something and you act upon it. Virtue, or we would say righteousness, moral excellence, being in right standing with God. Knowledge, self-control, patience. Can these things really play out in our lives? I mean, can it really be part of our everyday lives? I suggest it can. For instance, um, finances. I believe God. There's things that I, I don't understand, but just I, I trust God and I say, God, I have faith and I trust you in my finances. 100% of everything I have, it belongs to you. You let me be the steward of it. I, I get to be the manager here on this earth. But it, it's really yours. It's, it's not mine. It's, it's not my house. It's not my car. It's not my job. It's not my, my, my. It's yours. All of it. Everything is yours. And you let me be the manager of it. Virtue, righteousness. So this has to do with behaving like God says to do. That's really what virtue is, is just simply doing what you know you're supposed to do. And so uh, God says in His Word that um, we give a tithe to Him. As a beginning point, it says, a tenth of all that I make belongs to God. There's some people that never get past that spot right there. Just couldn't do that. Couldn't imagine doing that. How could I ever do that? But you see, it's, it's an act of, it's, it's a righteousness issue. It's, I'm going to do what you've called me to do. This is even before knowledge. This is before revelation. This is before self-control or any of those things. It's just, it's righteousness. And then, then knowledge begins to play in it. Knowledge feeding upon that faith and that virtue. Knowledge says, now God, there's some way that you make 90% more than 100%. Now I don't know how you do it. But I have learned and I have seen and I've studied and I know that people who practice tithing are blessed. And, I mean, there's studies. You, you could study Colgate and you could study uh, some of the people from history um, who, who have given in away and given away. Materno, for instance, man who lived on 10 lived on 10 percent and gave 90 percent away. Um, the, there's knowledge to be learned. And then self-control plays up upon that knowledge. Self-control, how would that relate to, to finances? It could be that I felt God tell me that I'm going to give $45 each week towards world missions in the year 2013. But Sunday morning comes and it's time to write out that check and put it in the offering plate. And, and self-control starts battling in here and saying, man, I sure could use that money over here. But self-control does this. Self-control says, flesh, carnal nature, get back in there. Get, you're going to come under control and you will do what I tell you to do. And, and through that, it brings about great patience in our lives. Now, Money is, is one area. You could do that with, with any number of things. You could do this with decision making for your life. You could use this wheel right here, this development of character, uh, to talk about personal uh, fitness, uh, diet, exercise, all of those things. All of this, I mean, this wheel of character development that Peter gives us in place into every area of our lives. So um, you're looking at a fellow journey here. I'm so journeying with you, and we're learning together. Um, I forgot to receive the offering talking about finances. And so after I say amen, um, Darren's got the offering bag right here, and he'll be, he'll be ready to receive an offering. If any of you would like to give, you're, you're welcome to. Um, but I want to just pray first. Darren, hold on. I want, to, I want to pray first and, and just close out the service. Let's bow our heads. Heavenly Father, what an honor 
to be your servants. I think of my life in the way that so very often I, I need self-control. I pray that you bring about that ability. Give me the knowledge I need at times to understand what's going on, then to be able to exercise that self-control. And I think for all of us, we, we need patience so very much, Father. We just don't want to hear that that means more opportunities for self-control, but it does. It is worth the reward of peace. There's a huge payoff. Oh God, I pray that you would bring about your patience in us. When I think about our church family, there are so many that are those seasoned Christians like we were talking about earlier, and I just thank you for them. I, I pray that we would feed off of them, that we would learn some things by them, by the, the way that they interact and the, the way that they demonstrate faith, by the choices of their lives. Help us to, each one of us, to begin to model that too. We don't have to walk with you too very long before we realize there are people that watch. They're watching us. They're watching all of us. Each one of us, we have mentors in our life, but we also are mentoring others. We can do that on purpose or on accident. I, I pray that we would do it on purpose. I pray that you help us to be the kind of Christians like Peter was describing in his second letter to the church. Thank you, Father, for all of your blessings. In Jesus' name, all God's children say, Amen. 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 All right, God bless you all. We'll see you back next time.